this third segment, titled ADAPT, we have as a goal to stimulate our leaders to rethink what it means to be resilient. Is resilience the construction of bunkers that will withstand category five plus storms? But then, what of earthquakes? Should we maybe focus on flexible structures? But then, what of tsunamis, volcanoes? Is resilience construction, or is it a state of mind and well-calculated, realistic decision-making and approaches to issues or sudden impactful events? Our panelists for this segment are Dr. Kenrick Leslie of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, Deputy Director of the Mona Geoinformatics Institute of the University of the West Indies, Dr. Ava Maxim, President of the Executive Committee of the Overseas Territories, Countries and Territories Association, Ms. Carol Vokas, and winner of the Writing Competition and student of the Agogic Center for Comprehensive Education, Mr. Kelron Bellot. Please come to the stage. The panel will be moderated, of course, by Mr. Tatsio Barefoots. Dr. Kenrick Leslie of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center is the executive director. In December of 2003, he was charged with the responsibility of transforming the center from a concept into a viable operational institution. The center became fully operational in January of 2005 as a regional executing agency on climate change related projects by the World Bank, various UN agencies, and the UK Department for International Development. Prior to joining the Climate Change Center, he was a senior principal scientist in the Applied Physics Laboratories of Allied Signal, now Honeywell Corporation in Morristown, New Jersey in the United States. He has also contributed much to the development of meteorology and climatology in the Caribbean. He has worked as a meteorologist in the meteorological services of Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and the Bahamas. Dr. Leslie established the National Meteorological Service of Belize and served as its first director from 1972 to 1981. In addition, he served on the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology from 1972 until 1981. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kenrick Leslie. Thank you very much for that introduction. And the protocol has been set, but I want to particularly thank His Excellency and the Prime Minister for inviting me once again to this beautiful island of St. Martin. When I came here the first time, it was after the hurricane, and I had to remark that I was pleasantly surprised at the reconstruction. In fact, unless you knew that a Category 5 hurricane had hit the island, you would not recognize that something had happened. So I think we should all use St. Martin as an example of how to put things in place that you can recover very rapidly. And coming back about six months later, I can see further changes. So I want to personally congratulate the government and people of St. Martin for a wonderful job well done. I had hoped to present a very comprehensive adaptation, but unfortunately, I have very limited time. I mentioned to the, His Excellency and the Prime Minister, just when I was getting ready to leave, I had a death in my family, so I have to leave on the flight this afternoon to get back to Belize. So I will just summarize very quickly what I had hoped to present this afternoon and I hope my colleagues in the panel will be able to fill in the gaps. But 
One of the things I want to mention, back in 2009 in Copenhagen, we all hear the term now very, used very loosely, 1.5 degrees to stay alive, 1.5 to stay alive. I'm very proud to say that was introduced by the five seas along with the alliance of small island states to that, com to that conference. It was something nobody had heard of, but we had recognized very early the implications if the temperatures rose above 1.5. I was extremely happy, but not totally happy, at the Paris Agreement when they eventually got the global community to recognize that we cannot have temperatures exceeding 1.5 and the global community then said and agreed to limit it to two degrees. But even then, we felt that was not good enough. And the same pioneering job that we took from 2009 to 2015, we decided to take the lead again. And with support from the Caribbean Development Bank and from our limited resources at the five Cs, we commissioned the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, along with our colleagues at Cave Hill, and our colleagues from the INSMET, the Institute of Meteorology in Cuba. We have worked together since 2004 in modeling the different types of impacts we will experience. So we commissioned them to do a study a detailed study of a comparison between what will happen at 1.5, what will happen at 2, and what will happen above 2 degrees. One of the problems that most people are not aware of, what you see coming out of the IPC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, comes from research done that have been peer reviewed. In other words, if it was not reviewed and published, they will not use it. And therefore, it was very important that we made sure that we had coming up, because out of the Paris Agreement, they had commissioned the IPC to look at what will happen at 1.5. And our colleagues at the University of the West Indies and INSMET in Cuba did that study, and we were able to get four published papers, the last one just came out, and got it into the IPCC. And as a result, on the 8th of this month, they released that special report on the impacts that will occur at 1.5 and above. They confirmed what we had long been telling the world, the impacts that will come to small island states, such as the islands in the Caribbean and the Pacific. So I am very happy that we have taken the lead, not once, not twice, but more into the third time, where we have shown, and your earlier speakers have mentioned, that it is not size that counts, it's what you do. And I want to make sure that when we leave here today, that we understand that not because we are small islands, not because we are limited in resources, that we cannot do for ourselves and show the rest of the world some leadership. The impacts of 2.5 or 1.5 is critical. The issues that the world organizations, the IPCC came about is that we will start experiencing the impacts of 1.5 by the mid 2040s. Our research have shown that this will start in the mid to late 2020s. Therefore, we still have work to do to get them to move. We move them from the above three, down to two, 
And now they have recognized we have to all work to 1.5. We will have to show them that this 1.5 is not 2040. We are already seeing some of the impacts. We have already crossed the one degree point. And therefore, adaptation now becomes extremely important. As I said, I had a prepared document here, but time will not allow me because I have to leave very shortly. So I will skip and go to different areas, okay? One of the most important things in terms of adaptation is to know what are we adapting to. And last night I was sitting at the hotel looking at the, the beach and admiring it. A report that came out earlier this year from NASA and another international research institution is saying that climate, the sea level rise is accelerating. It is not going at that steady pace. Already uh, since the start of the industrial, the sea level has risen by eight inches. And we keep saying, well, what is eight inches? However, what they are showing right now is that by the end of the century, it would have reached 26 inches. And that is not assuming what is happening in Greenland and in the Antarctic. If those continue to collapse the way they're going, it can reach 20 feet. But what does that 26 inches mean? I did a quick calculation, I'm looking at the beach. That would mean that we would have lost 12 feet of beach. Our economy is based on the beach, the sand, as we talked about, and so on. So just assuming 26 inches, losing 26 inches, uh, sorry, 12 feet of the beach, that also has implication in terms of salt water intrusion, the impact on any small scale agriculture or large scale agriculture. Another thing, as mentioned by uh, the last speaker, is the acidification. As acidification has increased by 30% already. That has implications in terms of our marine life. The marine economy to the region is significant. That's another area that we have to think about. And therefore, earlier somebody spoke about everything is good, but we must make sure that our children and adults, but starting with the children, understand clearly what climate change is about. If we do not introduce in our schools the details of what climate change is, we can all say, I know what is climate change, but you must understand the implications of climate change. Because each individual can play a role, not just government or a minister, it starts from the individual. And therefore, our educational system must be such that it will start to inculcate into our schools that climate change is not just a term. It has serious implications. We also heard at the um, luncheon, the first speaker, talk about renewable energy and different forms of renewable energy. But I want to highlight an area, because renewable energy comes in different forms, as he said. You can have wind, you can have solar, you can have geothermal, and all those will help us to get into the renewables. But I want to highlight one area which I did not hear from our speaker, and um, he can comment on that later on. Another form of renewable energy is OTEC, Ocean 
thermal energy conversion. And if I had to put my last penny on an investment for the region over solar, over wind, and so on, I would put it in OTEC. Let me tell you why. You see, they are all producing renewable energies. But one of the problems we are faced with in terms of the service industry, I use service industry, and most of our islands, the economy, the GDP, is based on the service, of which tourism is the biggest part. OK? Those who provide energy, but OTEC will provide two other byproducts that are essential. The first one is water. You see, out of OTEC, a byproduct is fresh water, something that we will all need as the climate impacts become more important. Because our models are showing that the Eastern Caribbean would be one of the areas where you would have a decrease in precipitation. Now, that doesn't mean we won't have serious flash flooding, because there's another side. It is not how you, it's how you get that rainfall. You can get all of it dumped in a very short time. You get flash flooding, and so on. So don't be misguided when I say you're going to have less rainfall. That has nothing to do with the impacts of heavy rainfall or droughts. So a byproduct of OTEC is water. Another byproduct, the water that comes from the very cold depths, as you know, like for instance, along the Pacific coast of South America, you have that current, that cold current that comes up and cause upwelling and brings up the nutrients from the bottom. That's where you have good fishing out there. The same thing, the byproduct from OTEC would be something we can use in mariculture. Since we will be impacted by acidification, reducing our fish stocks and so on, we must find something that will help us to replace. So OTEC, being another renewable energy, it has two critical byproducts. And therefore, I'd want to encourage our governments, our policymakers, to think seriously in terms of when you are going into renewables. I'm not saying you shouldn't do wind and so on, but think seriously about using the OTEC as well. And already it has started in the Bahamas. The Bahamas is now putting in place OTEC because it can be used for air conditioning as well, which means the hotels and so on. Instead of using energy from somewhere else, you can use it directly as a byproduct from OTEC. The Bahamas is doing it. Hawaii is doing it. The French has been doing it in re, um, reunion in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, and so on, the Japanese. So it is not something that is that far out. The same way we have to do research in terms of geothermal, we are now in a position where we can start to think seriously about OTEC. All our islands have very deep waters, and that's what you need to come to shallow waters. The cold water differential to the top is what you need to give you OTEC. So, as I said, education is critical. The renewable energy is critical, as our speaker during the lunch mentioned. All I'm emphasizing is OTEC as well. In fact, in Aruba, that's one of the areas they're thinking about for cooling. In terms of the understanding the other areas, we have learned and we heard from the Bahamas, I mean from BVI. I am extremely happy to say that the five C's was involved in helping BVI develop that trust. We started back in 2012, working with the government, helping put together the technical details for the legislatures, and now it is in place. We can all follow that. So we have two types of things we have to adapt to. The immediate, 
which is the severe storms and so on, but the long term, which would be rising sea levels, acidification, and how we use our land. And in closing, I want to say that the five C's have two areas that we can provide technical support to all islands in the Caribbean. One, when we are making decisions, we should be, it should be based on information, good data. We have a system in place right now that was supported by USAID, the Italian government, and so on, where we can do detailed airborne LIDAR measurements, both for bathymetric, topographic, and so on, that can be used in good land use planning. So we can determine areas of vulnerability more critically. Secondly, we have also developed a tool called Sea Coral. This is one that will help you make decisions in terms of what is the best adaptation to use and to assess very critically, is it right or wrong for what is being adopted? So as I said, time is limited for me. I will stop at this point. I had much more to, to give you, but in the interest of time, I will pause and allow my colleagues to talk. Thank you very much. Very many thanks for your talk, Dr. Leslie, and please accept deepest, deepest condolences for your loss. And uh, if you need to leave, then please, yes. by all means, and safe travels. So um, based on Dr. Leslie's talk, I will now you know, hope to frame the discussions around uh, the idea of adaptation. Um, I'm going to let our other panelists uh, introduce themselves briefly, uh, also give a one or two minute um, introduction in their work, and then we can launch right into the discussions in the interest of time. Uh, so Mr. Belot, all yours. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Kelron Joshua Prince Baylot, and I am currently a student at the Max CSE. I am not here today as an essay competition winner, but as a citizen and a youth of St. Martin who is quite aware of all the influences that can affect life and livelihood on my island and our region. Having a summit for one day may not be sufficient to give all the information and solutions that our people, my country, and all the countries represented here today need going forward. Yet I hope my being a part of this summit can be a viable first step in posting my ideas and solutions that can help my island region to generate plans for making our country resilient to these sometimes sudden and ongoing changes that are becoming more prevalent in today's world. Here on St. Martin, we contend with the elements on a daily basis. We experience all of the phenomena associated with a changing tropical climate, such as hurricanes, droughts, rising sea levels, erosion, flooding, etc. These are things that impact our environment, also our public health system. I have a goal to stimulate our leaders of St. Martin to start thinking differently on what it means to be resilient. Our government needs to upgrade building codes and create policies that introduce measures such as des desalinization, for example. As I stated in my essay, the same essay that won the competition, which have me standing here before you today, and I quote, resilience is having the capacity to go through the recovery process in a speedy manner in the wake of difficulties or toughness because of proper preparations. Thank you. Thank you. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ms. Vogus? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Vogus, and I'm the president of the executive committee of the Overseas Countries and Territories Association, also known as OCTA, so we'll keep it at OCTA. Um, OCTA's vision is for OCTs to be on a path of sustainable development whilst protecting their natural resources by developing, uh, by human development and capital development, uh, we, with cooperation with the EU, global partners, and partners in the region. So our core belief is unity and cooperation. 
Um, just last week, uh, I attended the launch of the Global Commission on Adaptation in The Hague, which is headed by uh, former SG of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, uh, World Bank CEO, and Mr. Bill Gates. And their accelerated adaptation was encouraged. Uh, and in fact, mitigation and adaptation in parallel was encouraged in this state in our current time. As OCTs, we are um, minor contributors to greenhouse uh, emissions, but we are um, mostly one of the most disproportionately impacted by climate change. Uh, just last year, many of the OCTs were affected by hurricanes Irma and Maria, and um, we have noticed now that, if anything, we need to increase our adaptive capacity. Um, as OCTs, we are all, and many of these islands are one and two sector economies, highly dependent on tourism, and um, we need to encourage the fact that while we are developing or redeveloping, we also keep in mind that development may come with barriers um, or reducing our buffers on our ecosystems. So whilst development is important, we also must keep in mind that to the, to develop sustainably, we also need to keep um, our natural habitat intact because that is our core market. Um, tourists come to us because we have beautiful islands. I mean, if that is not the case, it, they're, yeah, they're, they're not going to come as much. So actually, my, my goal for today is to see how we can come up with plans. We are here for the Regional Caribbean Program. Um, come up with plans and programs and projects that can lead us to increase our adaptive capacity and also do so in a way that um, we are able to grow and protect our environments at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause as well. <laughs> Dr. Maxim. Good afternoon, everyone. And I am Dr. Ava Maxim with the Mona Geoinformatics Institute. Uh, my background is in data management systems, so I'm more of a technical person or technical capacity here. Um, a lot of what we do, we look at uh, implemented infrastructure, um, hardware, software, but the most important uh, critical aspect of a lot of the systems that we implement is the people. And this is what it always comes back to um, when it comes to the success of, of systems and initiatives. Um, how much knowledge, how aware, how adapted are our people? I think it's been coming out in um, quite a few of, of the messages that we've heard so far um, that if the social intervention is not strong enough, if the social intervention um, isn't core and isn't paid attention to, then a lot of times a lot of these ideas and research, um, a lot of these plans for adaptation will end up failing. So I think that's a point that I want to stress um, today. Um, you know, just hearing more about what are the ideas, what are the solutions that have been working island to island um, in terms of, of convincing people to, to pay attention to adaptation, to pay attention to the hazards that will impact us, and of course, uh, for what they can do for themselves in their own unit. Um, how many of us, for example, at the family level, in, even individually for ourselves, um, know, for example, where uh, exits are to get out of your city or out of your town in, in cases of emergency? Um, how many of us have that discussion you know, whether every day, every month, every week. So just getting back to that core of, of um, going after social interventions that work, that is what is key. Thank you very much. Round of applause, please. Okay, I think I will again take the initiative to launch a discussion uh, for this last uh, panel. Uh, and I'm going to look at Mr. Bello uh, specifically. Sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we were all very impressed uh, by the essay that, that, uh, that you won. Thank and you. the, um, you know, it's included in, in our program. And you very eloquently put in the last sentence, you very eloquently wrote about the art of Caribbean regional resilience. Can you explain us a little bit more of what you mean by, uh, by that statement? When I place the art of Caribbean resilience, when I look at the Caribbean, it's more like a picture. 
And you know when you paint a picture, the painter takes his or her time to paint a nice picture. And the way I see the Caribbean and how we could be resilient is by taking our time and doing things step by step, one at a time to be resilient against these tragic tropical cyclones that are happening in the Caribbean. Thank you, very excellent, thank you very much. And then I had one more question for Dr. Maxim. Um, Dr. Leslie in his, in his keynote mentioned the importance of uh, the availability of data. Uh, you are uh, involved in the Geoinformatics Institute sure. in, uh, in Jamaica. Our Minister of the Environment and Infrastructure is also a GIS expert. Uh, how critical and how important is baseline data uh, to ensure that we are not only resilient, but that we also are very adaptive in the face of, of a climate, you know, changing climate? Yeah. Um, excellent question, because data is something um, that you know, we, we spend a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources um, trying to collect it. What's crucial is even a collection of the data, how, how does the information that come out of that data translate to people understanding it? Um, I mean, it's, it's really useless if nobody, you know, if, if um, the average person living in coastal areas doesn't really understand what a one meter rise means in sea level rise. Does that mean that it's going to impact where I live, where I work? Um, where my livelihood is. So that, that is what is crucial. Now, there are a lot of initiatives um, for data collection across the Caribbean. Um, even right now with the five Cs, uh, we're looking at developing a climate change data management system, um, implementing that and then mainstreaming it um, so that communities and the, the average person would understand what that information means. Um, data, of course, allows us to look at what has happened um, it allows us to also predict what may happen in the future. So there's a lot of projections that we can do if we had good baseline information. Um, the, the publications that Dr. Kendrick spoke about, um, also those publications now speak to, to the fact that yes, um, sea level rise is, is actually increasing. Its, its rate is increasing. Um, but then what does that mean now for us as there's people in our communities, um, uh, civil servants, private sector. What do we do now about that? Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Leslie? I would just like to add a little bit to what the previous speaker spoke of. Data is one thing, but we also must have it as information. That is even more important. Collecting the data by itself is not good enough. Therefore, it has to be in a form that the various sectors can use it to make decisions, okay? So collecting the data, we have been doing that all over, putting all the instruments and so on, but we have to go to the next level, and that is what she was talking about. Yep. We are now putting that together, and I'd like everybody here to understand that that type of information is available, go to our website. And if you see something that you wanted but it's not there, contact us. Because that is the purpose of our being. Therefore, don't say, I can't find it. There is this day of communications, we can easily get in contact and it will be provided in the format that you need it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then one last question for Ms. Vogus. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the resiliency, the importance of resiliency of ecosystems to, uh, you know, for us to bounce back from these tragic events that we've been faced with over the last year. Also the ecosystem goods and services that, for example, uh, coral reefs and mangrove ecosystems provide coastal protection, et cetera, et cetera. Do you see an increase in awareness amongst the octa of of the importance of the goods and services that these ecosystems do provide? Yeah, I believe so, because in fact, um, not only the Caribbean Regional Program is very much focused on uh, resilience and uh, in sustainable energy, energy and marine biodiversity, but also um, OCTA is also the author, uh, regional authorizing officer of a thematic program, which is focused on climate change with a component of disaster risk reduction, as well as um, sustainable energy. So for OCTs, it seems to be very a very relevant topic, and um, 
I think we, it, yeah, obviously it's important for us to now pool our resources. There's so much information available, different institutions, but now it's time for us to pull that together and see what we can do with it to come with effective regional planning. Um, last year we noticed, um, for example, we were affected, because uh, I'm also the representative, EU representative for Samaritan, we were affected by hurricanes in our region, a few OCTs in our region were affected. And then other OCTs, for example, Aruba, Curacao, uh, they assisted because they were not affected. So we need to make use of this, of our region, uh, and see how we, not only as OCTs, but in the broader region, can help each other and plan and prepare for these type of situations in the future. Thank you. Dr. Leslie? Uh, my time is fast running out. So <laughs> I would like to, to make one final comment. Um, adaptation. As I said, we must know what we are adapting to. And we have both what is called the immediate, that is the extreme tropical rain, storms, and so on, that we have to address. But there is the other aspect of climate change, the slow onset. And these are things we have to make sure we put in place proper policies to address the slow onset impacts. That includes the acidification, the sea level rise, mm -hmm. the environmental, how we treat the environment. So there are two sides of adapting, and we must address both. You can't do one in isolation okay. of the other. So I want to leave that as a point, that in adaptation, it is not just the immediate, how we recover, but the long term, because the long term could have even more serious impacts than the immediate. You see, the immediate, we can get help from outside to try to recover, but the long term, if we don't plan and adapt properly, we cannot recover from that. So that is my parting words. And I want to, once again to thank the Prime Minister in particular for having me here once again. And Excellency, thanks also to you. And to the audience in general, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. As Dr. Leslie leaves us, um, I would like to open up the discussion from the audience. Uh, if there are any questions or comments from the audience for the remainder of our panelists, now would be the time to pose them. Prime Minister Rukunat, Mike, please. Hi, just a quick question for Ms. Vogus. Um, what role does innovation and entrepreneurship play in accelerating this adaptation for resilience? Well, that's up to, that's up to us. For example, in this program, we can come up with ideas. Innovation is one of the drivers, um, so that can be part of the program. It's up to us to decide what are the projects we want to focus on. I think entrepreneurship is really important because when it comes to resilience, um, especially in, in small island development states, SMEs are extremely important for the economy. So if we can ensure that they have um, institutionalized, for example, um, we can in include certain policies for them so that when they are in these type of situations, that we can ensure that they can bounce back even quicker. Um, that is one aspect that we can look into under this resilience aspect of the program, for example. So I do believe that, especially because I'm an economist, I do believe SMEs are extremely important for our economies and that we should be able to stimulate their development and ensure that they are less vulnerable to external threats. And I think I'd like to make a, a point to that as well. Um, one of, of our biggest clients with hazards data, hazards information, risk information, is the private sector. It's, it's insurance companies and banks. They see the immediate value in knowing where uh, the risk is going to be highest and then knowing how to set their premiums and trying to um, predict, um, mm -hmm. as Isaac would have been explaining earlier, trying to predict um, where it is that we'll need to, to funnel the money 
right, for recovery. Um, but it, it does go to the bottom line of a lot of these companies if, if these hazards impact. Um, so adaptation is, is, is crucial, it's important for entrepreneurship. Um, and, and both at that macro level as well as for you know, smaller companies. Um, we, for example, are about to, to embark on trying to clean up the Kingston Harbour, which is a monumental project, um, going to cost a lot of money, long overdue, um, but there is this um, um, urgency now attached to it because a lot of the, the companies, um, financial groups realize that their headquarters happen to lie along <laughs> the Kingston Harbour shoreline. Um, climate change is, is becoming very, very real for them. We're in the boardrooms of these corporate companies and they're asking us the hard questions. Um, with sea level rise and these predictions that I'm hearing about, what does that mean for my facility, for my people, for my resources? Um, so, th so there is that recognition that's beginning with, with, the, with the private sector of how important it is to adapt. Um, and, and so, you know, this is where now we're seeing that a, a lot of the, the entrepreneurship, the, um, the, the new innovations that come with, with adapting um, can be spearheaded by, by the private sector. Thank you. Yes. And if I... And if I can add just a little bit to the topic as well, um, Prime Minister Rakhanath, I think that um, one of the things that is really important is understanding that in adaptation, in preparation, in even uh, becoming a United Caribbean, we have to also think about our economic resilience. And so from that perspective, that question that you're asking about innovation and the uh, stimulation of stronger economies, you know, we have uh, in, our, in our inherent vulnerabilities, it sits also in the type of economies that we have. I mean, of course, our natural and our natural advantages are also our natural disadvantages. So when we start talking about becoming more resilient, more resilient and uh, changing the way we live, changing the way our cities are built, uh, changing how everything we're doing in order to be uh, more ready for the, the, the upcoming climate change and the geopolitical changes that are associated with it, we have, to, we have to really think about how can we finance this? And through stimulating stronger and more resilient economies is the only way that we're gonna have the foundation built to be able to build on uh, a resilient countries. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lake. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? Good afternoon once again. Uh, being somewhat of a mentor to Kel Kevon, I can expound a bit on his idea and his take on the art of Caribbean resilience from a St. Martin standpoint. And please, people, bear with me as I keep belaboring that this is St. Martin. <laughs> um, Kelvon will tell you, because we had lots of discussion about this, what it felt like to wake up 24 hours after Irma passed and see people already helping each other to rebuild. Uh, living in a small island state where less than a month later we had our schools reopening in spite of the trauma and some of what we went through. So those type of experiences helped him to formulate that art of Caribbean and the St. Martin resilience. The, 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 the sort of art that does not come from the big companies as we just mentioned because we know that if their bottom line is going to get hurt they will spend money to get it fixed. <laughs> but what was more important is seeing the people, the communities. I'm a community leader, I'm a community activist and I live in an area where we could not wait for the big companies to come and help us. We had to start that same day to rebuild, repair and of course plan for the next storm that we heard was on the way. So this art of Caribbean resilience may be of more impact and more importance to some of us. I know that we spoke about, um, as Olivia just mentioned, moving our cities inland and, and, and stuff. Angola does not have that choice. And Angola is, as far as I know, lower than St. Martin. A sea level rise of even a half a meter can spread the death for quite a few people's livelihoods on Angola. St. Martin is not far behind. So this summit and all that is coming out here is 
maybe something that some of us might be looking at in the next five years. Yeah. But there's some of us who needs it now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bella, moving forward, as the future of our island, of our country, as a future Caribbean leader, hopefully, what is it that you would like to see specifically in terms of resilience against a changing climate for us as Caribbean people? Well, for us to be resilient, I want us to foremost be prepared, not only by hearing when it's coming, but by always being prepared, like being a soldier standing, just waiting for the army to come for us. I want us to stand also after the storm, helping each other and adapting to the situation we just went through and going through the situation like it's a war zone and we could get over it right away. Being resilient for me is when you knock down a sandcastle, you put it right back up. For me, that's how I see resilience for my Caribbean region. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we have time for one more comment. Ms. Lake? Well, I have a question that I would like to direct more at Dr. Maxim. Um, coming from the, the, the Mona Institute of Geoinformatics, I mean, I know that we've spent a lot of time today speaking about hurricanes, tropical cyclones, excessive rainfall, etc. but I'd like to also look into what the changing uh, region looks like. I mean, just recently we've had a very uh, detrimental earthquakes in, um, in Trinidad, but not only that, uh, within my lifetime, we've had a very large explosion in, uh, in our colleague islands, Montserrat. So I wonder in terms of adaptation or even, uh, we can go back to preparation for this one, um, how could we look at you know, the wider regional issues right. uh, in terms of uh, the context that we're speaking of today? Thank you. Um, looking at the wider regional issues, I think one of the um, best things we have going for us is the, the networking and connectivity. Even a summit like this where a lot of us can come together in the room and share experiences and share what works. Um, the, what the BVI has been doing, I wasn't even aware of half of that. And immediately I can think of, wow, these are um, solutions and initiatives that could easily apply to my island. Um, you know, taking, taking on technology and using technology as, as um, a, a very, very strong medium now for reaching people, um, I think that is also something that we need to capitalize on. Um, there's so much more now with the fourth industrial revolution that is upon us that we can do in having information get to people um, in a more accessible, more efficient manner. So it's, it's taking advantage of that as well that I think will make a big difference, regardless of the type of, of hazard, um, regardless of you know, whether the hazard is, is one that's immediate, like an earthquake, or even something that um, is, is more you know, slower moving, um, like climate change and so on. At least if we start to take advantage of, of the technology that's available now, um, I think that will make a big difference. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Mr. Brown? Yes, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Maxim um, a question. And the background is that when, after the hurricane uh, of Irma last year, you know, in the immediate phase after, and especially the, the phase thereafter getting into the, you know, uh, recovery and so on, um, we are faced with a lot of lack of data and a lot of the reports that we prepare are often preface, you know, with the fact that the data is oftentimes not 100% uh, reliable. That's a problem that we face. And I, um, I'm a bit passionate about geospatial information uh, management, and I was surprised to see, you know, someone of your background in the uh, panel. But um, I would wonder if you would be able to um, bring some insights that would bring home the value of especially geo geospatial information management um, and the value of that to uh, disaster risk reduction and even to climate change. Because that's something that I, I believe especially smaller uh, territories, countries are challenged with when it concerns capacities right. and, uh, and so on. And you mentioned the aspect of, you know, you, you have technologies being available, but it's the human element that is oftentimes lacking. Um, so I wonder if you could touch a little bit 
on that to bring home that message? Uh, there's a lot of information that was collected. Um, we're probably not aware of it because we just didn't have access to it. You know, there's a lot of information that was being collected um, when the storms were approaching, um, information that was collected while it, a lot of the impacts were happening and then afterwards. But how, how do we get our hands on that information and then use it to our benefit and use it in good time? Um, that's, that's a big issue that we face. Now, there are a lot of, of, of gaps um, I mean, there are different parts of the Caribbean where I can say, you know, some islands are more data rich than others. Um, but I think the crucial problem is, is really the accessibility to that information. A lot of this information lies in, in databases um, that are on the web somewhere. Um, if you go to the Five Cs database, for example, there are you know portals that you can go to and get a lot of information on climate change and um, hydrometeorology and so on. Um, but, you know, I, I think what, what's critical when it comes to, to data is, for example, the role of the media. Is the media having access to this kind of information and then are, are they interpreting it properly in a way that the general public can understand it and then know how to react to it? So I think there is that responsibility of the media in being um, responsible with a lot of this information and data and, and making sure that they're using reliable sources as well. Um, there's a, a second thing that we like to do with, our, with how we treat data, especially if we think that there are gaps. Um, if, if the robust and um, high frequency, you know, that depth of information is not available, at least let's look at proxy information. Um, what else, what other indicator out there can help us try to assess what's happening? A good example of that is when we had the Zika outbreaks. Um, I realize that we haven't really touched on, on the health yeah. industry as yet. But uh, when that came to quite a few of our islands, we're considered um, naive populations. And so, you know, the virus spread through the island so quickly. And there was a loss in productivity because people couldn't get to work. Um, children weren't in school and so on. And it, it was very, very difficult to, to collect um, what we're deeming the reliable data because the, the test kits at the time were not available. And so the government's estimate of how many people contracted this virus were like um, maybe 3,000 people. But out of a population of, of um, 2 million people, what we did instead was look at um, absenteeism in schools. And that was data that could be collected immediately from the government. Um, and we could see just by looking at who was absent when the, the pattern of the spread of the Zika virus across the island. So some people may not deem that as official data, but it was still information that could fill a gap at the time. It could fill a gap for knowing how to deploy our health resources, um, knowing where to go to trying to, to get ahead of where mm -hmm. the, the virus was spreading, um, to you know, spread awareness, to educate people, and then try as much as possible to mitigate. Um, so I would say that that's you know, another um, solution to look at. Don't just try to depend on you know, the official um, high resolution information or the highly accurate information, because that may take some time to get to. But see what else is there that you can also use as proxy information, because that may also help, especially for operations. Thank you. And with that, uh, we come to the end of our panel discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. I see Joy is nodding at me and, and <laughs> making hand movements. Uh, luckily, we have breakout sessions scheduled next. So if you have any other questions or comments that we'd like to raise with our panelists, that would be the perfect opportunity to do so. So thank you to our panelists. Big round of applause. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to pass the word to Joy. Thank you, Tatsio. Thank you, panelists. Don't leave us oh. yet before um, we do have something that we have to share. However, the, His Excellency uh, Eugene Holliday, the Governor of St. Martin, has to leave. And he regrets that he has to leave at this time. But we thank him very much for the time he's been able to spend with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please stand. Thank you. You may be seated. Actually, Tatsu, while we await the Prime Minister to come back to, to make the presentations, we might be able to take one more comment or question. 
One very fast, quick, <laughs> succinct <Last> question <laughs> or comment from in the audience. Anyone? <laughs> yes. One question in the back. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have a question. Um, what do we have to do in cases, um, how, how fast can we get the information to the public regarding, um, for example, uh, oncoming hurricane systems? Is there any warning system set up, say for instance, um, where people could have um, close access to, to find information? Anyone could answer on the panel. I ask the panel to maybe I mean, my, my go-to is always Facebook and, and WhatsApp, but perhaps, <laughs> perhaps there are more official, uh, official means of, of getting data. Maybe Mr. Jackson? There, there are a number of sources. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of sources. I think that's, that's the easiest thing to, to provide information to the public on. And there are new things coming out now in terms of apps that are giving you instantaneous information on, on, on warning. Um, very um, I say innovative things being done in Barbados with Bayesian Alert. Uh, we're working with groups called Sonar that can provide this information but also feedback instantaneously. But that doesn't remove the, the Met offices and their particular role as the lead forecast house. And they also have um, apps that are providing information so different platforms on which we like to communicate, since that we're, we're no longer a population that watches, watches the news right. <laughs> regularly. Right. Um, so that's, that's what I would, would, would suggest. The, the challenge, though, is not the hurricanes. The and the challenge is not the before. The challenge is the, in the immediate aftermath in terms of what may be coming next. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. the communications infrastructure and their, and their resilience right. in being able to, to keep in touch with people and also for those events that don't give the time frame of warning that tropical storms and hurricanes. So, uh, Dominica, December 2013, two troughs colliding, uh, rainfall over Christmas Eve into Christmas morning, losses, tremendous death toll, more than it should yeah. be. People were listening to Christmas carols, baking cakes, not paying attention to the Met Office. How do we deal with the the warning environment in that context, you know, is it sirens, etc. So those are the more complex issues around warning we're trying to resolve at the moment. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, Dr. Jackson. Okay. And with that, we come to the end of our session, and uh, I pass the word again to my co-host, <laughs> the lovely you. Joy. Thank you, Tatsu. I'd like to invite the Prime Minister and the Minister of Education to give present token of appreciation to our panelists. I'd like to call Mr. Bellot. Minister of Education will do the presentation. Thank you very much for <laughs> the essay, for participating in this summit. Uh, did an excellent job. There's a, quite some prospects for you in the future. And hope to see you back on a summit like this. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Volkers. For your participation, Ms. Wilkes, you make St. Martin very proud. For those who don't know, she's actually from St. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Very proud. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Maxim. Dr. Maxim, it was an honor to meet you and your thank presentation you and valuable information. We want to say just thank you. And on behalf of our the committee and the summit, just a token of our appreciation. As well. Thank you. I appreciate it, Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you, panelists. We're going to move straight into our. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Moons and Mr. Hastings. Can you step forward, please? You are presented during lunch. And we'd like to present to you a token of our appreciation. Mr. Robert Ian Moons, the person that timely 
gave his presentation as his prime minister entered. Huh? <laughs> Thank you for your participation and valuable information on renewable energy. You know, I think that information was quite um, impactful, and it's good to see that Aruba is heading in. It was one of the leaders in the Caribbean in that direction, and the information that you gave was quite um, um, valuable. On behalf of the committee and as regional authorizing officer and the whole team, we want to say thank you. And here's a token of our appreciation. Thank you so much, Mr. Mr. Prime Minister. Yeah. Mr. Hastings. I never thought that I would have met someone as enthusiastic as Mr. Tats your better foods. <laughs> Todd, so you have some competition here. But Mr. Merving Hastings, I want to thank you for the information that you gave. And, you know, it is important, certain things that uh, the gentleman, or no, the young lady, Dr. Maxim stated. Information is out there. BVI is doing great things. But it's time to share. <laughs> because we can all learn from each other, and that's something valuable that we've learned today. And uh, when they ask, how can we do things better, by participating in summits as such, the information is quite valuable for each one of us. And you can just pass on the information, guide us through workshops throughout the Caribbean, and we will be definitely a more resilient place. Thank you. Okay, and of course, our keynote, not a keynote, but I would say keynote speaker still, but definitely our moderator, Tatsio Perfuts, the gentleman that have passion for marine biodiversity, mammals, coral reef, you name it. He puts us on the spot here as a government on St. Martin, so we know that we have an avid activist here on the island. Thank you for taking the invitation for being our moderator for today. And like I stated before, I see your competition in here, but it's not about competition, but it's morely, mostly about com completing each other. And you're from St. Martin, he's from BVI, I'm sure that you all can do great things and I'm, I'm very much open to see what next is gonna come on the table after this. I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of mandates from you, but I thank you, um, Bervoots, you are quite instrumental for St. Martin and what you stand for, continue to stand up for that. Thank you. And to Ms. Joy Arnell, the yeah, I'm not finished. You're not finished, but this is the time you get you get your um, your um, your gift. When we were looking for someone to to be the the person, the spoke person for this entire summit, her name automatically came up. She had no choice, actually. Um, definitely, I want to thank you for your input, your professionalism, and thank you for guiding us through this entire um, program. You have done a great job. And of course, she's from St. Martin as well. <laughs> I, just, I just had to add that. But um, I thank you for your input, and I thank you for what you've done for us here today, and on behalf of all of us. And uh, I would like to offer you a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. It's been a long day, but very productive day. Dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, we have spent the earlier part of today listening to the esteemed speakers and panelists on the core topics of Caribbean OCTs, Resilience Summit, Unite, Prepare, and Adapt. From the discussion, it appears to me that we are well on the way to a real strategy for true resilience in the Caribbean. What we recognize from today's session is that we have no challenges with respect to uniting as OCTs. However, we also recognize that the Caribbean and its associated challenges are further reaching than, that, than the OCTs alone. 
Going forward, we will aim to share this message and mission to our regional partners at the ACS, OECS, CARICOM, CARI Forum to ensure that we can reach and engage with the entire Caribbean. And when we speak to Caribbean resilience, we want to approach this message from the widest regional perspective possible. United preparation is already a strong foundation for resilience. As our esteemed guest speaker from the executive committee of OCTA explained, we don't all have the same issues at the same time. We can easily come to each other's aid in a number of ways. Taking from this a unified and well-prepared approach to our obvious need for adaptation is the next logical step for the Caribbean as a region. With our individualities well-maintained and our similar vulnerabilities decreased through innovative and novel approaches. Today's three topics, however, were also designed as a simple mathematical equation and lead me to pose the question to you. If we unite strategically, prepare adequately, and adapt accordingly, are we on the path to overcoming our region's climate and geographic challenges? Unite plus prepare plus adapt equals to overcome. Now that we have arrived at the topic of overcome, what could this look like? I would like to refer to some of the matters that we were discussed today and maybe be valuable to overcoming our regional vulnerabilities. It was expressed multiple times that the political leadership is essential if we strive for a resilient region. This political leadership at the OCT level, however, it also means regional leadership in which we, as politicians, must put our heads together and gather essential information on how to move forward. As such, I would like to invite all OCT representatives here today to take home with you the lessons learned today and reflect on how we can follow up on them from a local and regional perspective. I say local and regional as both are essential elements in building resilience. As was stated by the Honorable Dr. Peckering, a bottom-up approach in facing regional challenges is interdependent with strengthening regional leadership. Improving communication, modernization of our methods and approaches is also very synonymous with adaptation. As our speaker, Dr. Mascom, pointed out, it is not solely the availability of data that is challenging to us, that is challenging us, but also the manner in which the data is collected, used, and interpreted. In many cases, we need to ask the right questions in order to get the answers to solve the issues that we really need solving. Such questions also evolve around what resilience means and where we should look for it. Resilience, as was expressed a number of times, does not only evolve around our natural environment, but also touches on aspects as social security, financing, the digital realm, and health some of which have not even been explored in today's session, but were specifically raised. This leads me to, follow, to the following conclusion. The need for events such as organized, that is organized today, are essential to raise local topics at the regional level so that we can learn from each other. As regional leaders, when we engage on these matters and express our commitment, we pave the road to policy development and cooperation for our technical teams. We do not need to reinvent the wheel as we, as small island territories, face similar challenges. We do not stand alone. So what's next? Well, we have the 11th EDF Caribbean Regional Program as the perfect conduit to making the next step. 
The way forward coming out of this session will lead to the development of the first key actions towards overcoming the challenges faced in our region and towards the solidification of the concept resilient Caribbean. In closing, I encourage our technical teams to use these discussions as a starting point for the implementation of this program. And I end by saying, the leaders have spoken. Thank you, Prime Minister. Well said. The challenge is now for the leaders. Take it back and make it work.